Our next speaker is Peter Opperman. Uh, he's a fourth year PhD student at the Institute of Autonomous Cyber Physical Systems at Hamburg University of Technology. He also received his master's in computer science and engineering there. His research focus is on low power acoustic communication and power delivery and on sensors for structural health monitoring. So Peter, please go ahead. One second, you see not my presentation. That is, maybe if you start the slideshow. No, I think oh. it's extending the screen. One second. Ah. Sorry. Hmm. Maybe that should work. Yep, it's all right. Good. Uh, yeah, thanks for the introduction and sorry for the delay. Um, so this is the uh, work of my colleague Christian Renner and me. Uh, we have investigated higher order modulation for uh, acoustic backscatter in metals. So I was going to start with um, um, telling you why acoustic communication um, is interesting after all, but I think the previous two uh, speakers already did that quite a bit. Oh, and this is also not ideal here. All right, that's better. Um, yeah, but uh, I'm going to tell you anyway. So um, underwater, we've seen that um, the same goes uh, actually for human uh, in sensors within the human body. So the body is mostly water, so there's also a strong attenuation of um, radio frequency waves. Acoustics can help there as well. Um, and there's shielding by metals. So we concentrate on metals today. Um, there are uh, numerous applications, like pretty much whenever you have a sensor within a shield, uh, com a container, a metal container, that could be a pipeline, could be a bioreactor. Um, actually, there's also interest in uh, nuclear power plants um, and in structural health monitoring, as we've seen before. Uh, so let me start by quickly introducing you um, to how uh, acoustic backscatter communication works. Um, a backscatter system consists of a reader and a tag. The reader is generating a continuous uh, carrier wave, and the tag can then use this carrier wave to harvest energy from it to power its own circuits, um, and it can uh, reflect or uh, not reflect the wave um, to transmit data back, uh, which has the advantage that the tag doesn't really need any um, oscillators or other high-powered um, hardware. Um, so uh, the challenges with this, however, is that those um, ultrasonic transducers, those piezoelectric disks, they are very narrow band, so we only have a very limited bandwidth available. Uh, the metal channels are very frequency selective, um, as we've also seen in the last two talks. Uh, and the piezo um, input impedance is very uh, unpredictable, and don't worry, I will go into that a bit later. Um, but let me first summarize the basic idea of our uh, work, um, and that is that instead of what usually is done, um, just uh, switching between reflecting and not reflecting, we want to enable higher order modulation in acoustic backscatter. That means that instead of using a, trans, uh, a transistor um, like, uh, like usually and just um, absorb or reflect the wave, we use complex impedances to uh, change the reflection in, um, uh, in any way uh, that we like. Um, so what our paper uh, contributes for that is uh, that we gave a thorough analysis of the through metal um, acoustic channel. Um, we have designed a custom reader and tag hardware, um, which was necessary since in that frequency ranges there's no real uh, available off-the-shelf um, integrated circuits. Um, and uh, we provide a calibration procedure that chooses um, ideal frequency and um, yeah, uh, load uh, impedances so that we can enhance the SNR as much as possible. Okay, so let's first look into the limited bandwidth that I mentioned before. 
um, such a piezoelectric disk, so I show here a, a transfer function from one piezo to the next, um, has a resonance frequency, and at this resonance frequency there's a high peak in this transfer function, and this peak is very narrow, usually. So we can only really use the bandwidth close to the resonance, um, and uh, that is a bit of a problem, because if we want to speed up data rates, um, uh, and, and speed up symbol rates, uh, that will actually um, expand the bandwidth that we use. So that's not really an option there. Um, and an uh, alternative to that is to keep the lower symbol rate, but then use higher order modulation so that we use the available bandwidth more efficiently. Um, so how do we actually do that? Um, so so what, what the tech can really control is only the reflection coefficient on its transducer. Uh, the reflection coefficient is a function of the um, tag transducer's input impedance that I have denoted as ZI here, and um, of the load impedance that we apply to the tag. And this is a highly nonlinear function. So ideally, we can just um, select four different load impedances at the tag's um, transducer so that uh, we produce um, different reflection coefficients, yeah, so um, for when, when we, as soon as we switch to a different load, we get a different reflection coefficient. Uh, so now is the question, how do we have to choose those load impedance to get a nice constellation diagram, like shown on the right for like a 4QAM modulation scheme? Um, well, so if we know the input impedance of the transducer, then it's easy, right? We have the formula, we can calculate what load do we need for, for, for what reflection coefficient, and then that's done. Um, so what about this input impedance? So if we have a transducer that's only um, in air, and I guess if you are underwater, it's pretty much the same, then you have a characteristic curve uh, of the input impedance where you have um, 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 a minimum at the, Im at the resonance frequency, um, and then that's pretty much the same for identical transducers, so you just need to measure that once for a transducer, and then you can always use it. Um, problem is, as soon as you attach the transducer to a metal specimen, uh, the complex resonance behavior of the metal um, will, uh, will superimpose with the um, with the with, uh, uh, impedance of the transducer, and you see that, the func that this um, function now is wildly uh, changing within just a few kilohertz or so, um, and the important thing is that it's not the same anymore, so it depends on whether you uh, attach, where you attach um, this transducer, it, it will always be different. So we can't have a one-size-fits-all approach, where we have on every um, uh, on every tag, the same load impedances. Um, on the other hand, if we have to design a custom tag um, for everywhere where we want to put those transducers, that's very um, expensive, manual labor, and so on, so that's not really preferable as well. So our approach was to design a tag that can um, generate a wide range of different um, load impedances, uh, so therefore we used a analog switch um, and a set of, of different reactances between which we can switch. So those are just um, inductors and capacitors, basically. And in series with that, there's a potentiometer where we can, um, f with a high resolution, change the series resistance. Um, so all in all, this tag can generate more than 5,000 different load impedances over a wide range. Um, and uh, that, th that enables us to, to um, adapt to any channel that we, um, that we like. Um, so, but that comes with another problem. Uh, since we can now generate 5,000 load impedances, we somehow have to choose uh, on the fly um, which ones we, we want to take for, for, for a specific channel. So therefore, we need a calibration procedure. Uh, again, there's, of course, the option to just test all 5,000 ones, uh, but that takes a lot of time and energy since breather and tech need both to be active during that. So our approach was here to model the um, acoustic channel uh, with an equivalent circuit that's um, well established in literature. Um, and this, the, the goal is now to get an analytic representation of um, how 
the received signal at the reader um, depends on the load impedance at the tag. Um, so we derived that function from the circuit, and it's not important to understand this, uh, this um, a function here um, in detail, but the important thing is uh, it has four unknown parameters, um, and those unknown parameters we now need to, um, to estimate for, for a given channel. Um, and it uh, turns out that we can do that with just uh, three uh, different measurements. So the idea is that the tag now sends a pilot message at the beginning where it switches between the three different um, load impedances. The reader can uh, receive those and um, then knows like three measurement points of what was the load impedance, what did I receive, um, and uh, it can then um, predict for all of the 5,000 different possible loads uh, what it would receive here. So, for example, in the diagram shown on the right, um, there's a line for every reactance that we can choose at the, at the tag, uh, and then we can move along the line by changing the resistance. Um, so now the reader is able to um, say, okay, I want to have a 4 QAM modulation, so which four points do I have to, can I take so that, um, that they are uniformly spaced and well um, far, far, far apart? So, for example, for 4 QAM, it could just choose those four points because they are um, the furthest apart from each other. Um, and uh, then we have our 4 QAM constellation. Um, the reader sends that to the information to the tag, and now the tag has the best possible set of load impedances. Um, okay, so of course we evaluated that um, and how well this equivalent circuit um, fits the reality. Um, and here, for example, I've shown one diagram for one channel. In total, we have tested that for five different channels, but on this channel, uh, now I've, uh, to make it a bit more um, visible, I've chosen 16 different uh, constellation points, so a 16 QAM modulation. Um, and those are the predicted ones that you see. If we now really measure what, uh, what really happens if we apply those load impedances, then we end up at this point, and you see it fits fairly well. There are some deviations, um, but uh, they are rather small, so to get a quantitative um, an idea of how big that is, um, and, uh, on average, in all five channels, we just had a 4% deviation relative to the distance between constellation points. So that's not really significant for decoding um, the message at the end. Uh, of course, the higher the modulation order is, so the more constellation points we have, the closer they will be, uh, and the deviation will then have a much um, more significant uh, impact. Okay, then finally, we also um, implemented a whole packet-based communication scheme uh, to see um, how, how, how well that works. Uh, also here, we had five channels on two different uh, specimens. And for example, here we have one specimen that's up to three and a half meters long. Longest channel is three meters apart. And um, there are several transducers on, this, um, on the specimen. And for all of them, we have tested how, how well communication works. Um, and on every channel, we have applied our calibration procedure, obviously, to choose the best uh, load impedances. So what would you see? We saw um, for uh, higher order modulation that we could, um, well, at first, uh, we, 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 co we couldn't get a speed up. So as you see here, n equals 2 means binary modulation, just two constellation points, and then the higher we go. Um, there are um, um, uh, yeah, more modulation, uh, higher order modulation, and uh, you also have two channels. So um, then we also had, uh, at first, we, we, we didn't achieve any um, success. So we actually had um, um, smaller um, effective data rates here, um, and that was because, well, the closer constellation points are, uh, the easier it is to miss. Um, uh, misinterpret a uh, received symbol, um, and due to very high intersymbol interference in those uh, metal channels, that, that was a problem. So then we also applied channel coding to it to 
um, make up for, for little uh, uncertainties. Uh, we used an LDBC code with a quite high rate. Um, and b both together, higher order modulation and channel coding actually achieves much higher data rates. So in the um, first channel where the transducers are just very close by, directly through the metal, we actually could achieve 211% um, increase in data rate compared to binary modulation. Um, and in the, in the other channels, the guided wave channels, where we go along the metal, um, the inter symbol interference is just much more strong. So th we couldn't have such a high increase there, but still 66% increase in, in achievable data rate was uh, possible. So as I said, we, we, we tested five different channels. I only show here two now, but we could get an increase for, for all of them. Um, well, yes, as I said, the inter symbol interference, however, is still the limiting factor here. And to conclude that, um, yeah, we've seen that, that we can actually get an improvement by dynamic um, impedance selection and frequency selection. Um, and that higher order modulation is uh, indeed giving us a speed up of up to 211%. And future, now the, the um, normal way how to deal with the inter symbol interference that is now limiting us would be to use an equalizer. That's not really straightforward in backscatter channels, but um, since we submitted this paper to SIGCOM, we've been working on that and uh, um, achieved, um, again, a five times increase in data rate with equalization, uh, which will be um, published on uh, EWSN this year. This is in October. Um, and yeah, so the uh, next steps are then to go to multi-tag environments. Uh, so have one reader, multiple tags. Um, which is also not really straightforward. And then, of course, the wireless energy transmission to power our tech. We didn't implement it in our prototype, but that's also one of the next steps that we are going to do. Yeah, with that, I'm done, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Inter interesting. I, I'm just curious, the ranges that you had, like a meter plus, to have a, um, multiple meters, I know nothing about the kind of applications, even though you alluded to them early on. It would seem like, at least in many applications, if you want to signal, it would probably be at least an order of magnitude, if not two orders of magnitude large, or like across a whole ship bow, bow or across a bunch of containers, or whatever other large steel structures you have. Any comments on how any of that translates into, or am I just mistaken, those long, quote, long distance applications aren't really all that interesting, or is it that you could extend your work to these, quote, long distance, I mean? Mm. meter, 10 meter, 100 meter type distances on large structures, steel structures or containers? Yeah, um, so maybe two answers. The first one is um, most applications that have been um, uh, investigated in, in literature were actually very close by. So like you have a, a container and then you have two two transducers just on one side of the metal and then the other, that just a few centimeters apart. But I um, share your point that uh, it would be desirable, especially for like pipeline monitoring, to have much longer distances. Um, and I uh, see this, uh, I, I would say it is definitely possible to go much longer. So this was just the first try, um, but you get quite high signal to noise ratios since um, metal is a very good conductor for acoustics. Um, so uh, as soon as, as you solve the inter symbol interference problems, um, I'm very sure that you can go much higher. Maybe you have to go with lower data rates then, but still it would be possible, yeah, so. Other questions? 
Uh, thanks for your talk. This is Bill from UIUC, and uh, I'm just curious about the uh, in metals uh, in uh, in your title. So, do you think your uh, finding can be generalized to other types of uh, solid, like bricks, or other type of crystals, or do you think uh, there is some uh, specific and special uh, features of metals uh, that makes your uh, results uh, special here and not generalizable? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, thanks for the question. So, in general. Like those equivalent circuit model that I showed is not not as special for metals, so it is also possible for all other um, kinds of solids and uh, also even underwater it would be valid. Um, the only issue that I see is that um, other metals are uh, other materials are not um, that well conducting um, ultrasound. So I'm actually surprised uh, from my previous talk, uh, about the previous talk about concrete, that this worked so well because concrete is very inhomogeneous. You have a lot of um, different materials and air bubbles in it and so on, and the acoustic waves um, are scattered by every inhomogeneity. So um, metals are kind of the, the optimal case, um, but in general, probably with lower SNRs, it should also be extendable to other materials, yes. Okay, great. Let's thank the speaker again. Thanks, Peter. Yeah.